Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar and panel discussion. I'm Lana Foster, I'm the Managing Director of Bright World Guardianships and we are hosting today's event. And I'm delighted to see so many hundreds of people joining us today. We have representatives of UK boarding schools, guardianship organisations, educational agencies from all around the world, and of course, parents of international students, all joining today to watch and listen to our panel. And the title of the webinar today is a safe September welcome to international students at UK boarding schools. And the aim is to extend our welcome to schools and guardians and to reassure parents and overseas agents that we're ready to accept students back in September and that they will be safe. At the end of the panel discussion today, if time allows, I'll be opening questions to everyone who's listening and watching and will attempt to answer as many of those questions as possible. And you'll be able to use the Q&A um, section, which is in just to the right of the centre of your screen at the bottom. Uh, please put any questions that you have in there that haven't already been answered and we'll try and get through as many of them as, as time allows. So now without further ado, I'm going to introduce you all to our panellists um, one by one. So first of all, um, Eve Jardine Young, who's the principal of Cheltenham Ladies College. Hello Eve. And uh, Gareth Collier the principal of Cardiff Sixth Form College. Thank you for joining us today. Corrie Loud, the headmaster of Box Hill School in Surrey. Jeremy Courtmain, the headmaster of Russell School. Adam Lubbock, who's the chair of Aegis and also the director of Kings River Education Safeguarding Consultants. Suzanne Rouse, welcome and thank you for joining us. Suzanne is the director of the British Boarding Schools Network. We're joined also by Naomi Goldstein, who's the senior manager at Fragman LLP, the immigration lawyers and specialists. Charlotte, thanks for joining. Charlotte's our very own director of sales and marketing at Bright World. And last, but by no means least, um, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Alex McGrath, who is the Global Director of British Council Schools. And I'm now going to actually hand over to Alex to answer the, the first question that, that we want to pose to the attendees, uh, to, to the panel. Alex, are international students welcome in the UK? And how important are they to us and why? Alex, are you there? I am, yes. I'm sorry, I'm having some connection difficulty. I'm really apologising. Can people hear me? Yes, uh, yes, hear you. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, thank you for, for uh, asking us uh, along here today. Uh, the British Council is the UK's organisation for cultural relations and educational opportunities. And so the first part of the question, are uh, overseas students welcome? Absolutely, of course they are. And, um, and uh, I'm delighted to have seen the way in which our boarding schools, our guardianship agencies, our universities have all been doing so much during the COVID-19 pandemic to ensure that, um, that we are ready to accept people in September. Um, for over 85 years, the British Council has been building connections between people. It's one of our strengths, but um, we're actually a very young organisation compared to some of these schools which are, uh, are being represented today. Um, and, um, and schools in the UK for centuries have been uh, welcoming and educating students. And, um, and certainly for decades, have been welcoming students from overseas. So um, it's, uh, it's thrilling to be part of um, such a distinguished panel and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, all the ways in which our uh, education providers are getting ready 
to accept our international partners. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question that we have um, goes to Jeremy uh, at Russell School. Jeremy, could you explain a little bit more to us about the SaveSchoolsUK.org initiative and how UK schools are working together to ensure a safe return for international students in, in September? Sure, thank you, Lana, and thank you for uh, in, in inviting me along. Um, so in terms of the, the Safe Schools UK movement, it's really an, an example of the UK boarding sector working together fantastically well. And, and I think that in, in so many different respects, the sector has worked together um, superbly during the last little while. So we have about 45 like-minded partners, including many leading independent schools, guardianship companies and so forth. And we're all committed to working together to ensure that as a sector, we adopt those procedures, those protocols that are internationally recognized as best practice in educational settings. So our member schools are committed to going above and beyond the recommendations of Public Health England and the equivalent public health bodies in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. We embrace the Boarding School Association Charter, but we've committed to some additional measures that we believe provide absolute peace of mind to our UK and international parents. So for example, our member schools have committed to encouraging the wearing of face masks for, for pupils and teachers whilst in classes. And we have our junior school back here now and they're all wearing face masks and, and yeah, they're almost like fashion accessories for the children. Um, but also it's about adopting additional measures such as thermal imaging technology, uh, we're rolling out our own track and trace system, which uh, has a technological element. And I know other, other schools are looking at doing that. It's about where possible providing single occupancy rooms for all boarders. It's about guaranteeing, and I think it's probably the most important aspect, it's about guaranteeing a continuous provision of teaching and learning. I think it's so important in uncertain times. And it's also about ensuring that obviously all children can travel to and from air, between airports and schools entirely safely. It's about making sure that at half terms and holidays, uh, schools remain open to their borders so that parents really do have that, that peace of mind. And across the sector, we're, we're working together um, to, to make sure that, that that's a reality obviously moving forward. Thank you very much indeed. I think it's um, a superb initiative and it's great to know that schools are working together in such a way. Um, if I can just turn now to Adam, Adam Lubbock, um, can you tell me, Adam, what Aegis, the accreditation um, organisation for guardianship organisations, is doing? And do you have a similar statement and pledge of support, such as the, the Safe Schools initiative? So thank you very much, Lana, um, for the invite today and to speak on behalf of, of Aegis. Um, sure. So Aegis um, fully supports um, the Safe Schools initiative that Jeremy has just um, talked about. So um, it's, it's great that we've got a lot of working together from organisations, um, but also within um, guardianship, but also through to um, boarding schools. And that's something that we've seen a lot of um, happening over recent months, a huge increase of the working together, um, all in a very, very positive way going forward which is which is fantastic um, but it's something that uh, we, we do have our own Aegis statement with regards to uh, this which we put on our website I won't go through all the ins and outs on there but please do feel free to to have a look at the Aegis um, website um, it, it's quite a, a useful website that uh, helps um, with, with um, parents who, who are looking at the care of their children when they come over to the UK but we certainly fully support the, the safe schools initiative um, and uh, you know, we, we want um, parents to feel happy that the children, when they send their children over to the UK, that they are safely looked after. And that's where we have the highest standards for guardianship. Um, they are inspected um, appropriately um, to make sure that they, they have all, all the right credentials to, to care for children. For children, children. But, all, but also, um, we look at our, our emblem, which, our is, emblem, the, which is, the, is the protector. protector. Um, and that, um, that is and all. That, that is all whole process of Aegis. So we have um, a list of guardians who also support with, with quarantine arrangements as well. So there's a lot of support and working together throughout the whole sector. Um, so it's not just from Public Health England that we take advice, we also take advice from the whole sector and uh, fantastic to be part of safe schools in this way as well. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you very much, Adam. Thank you. Um, it's reassuring to know um, that we're all working together, guardians and schools. Now, here's a question. I'm posing it to Gareth and Charlotte. Um, it's a big question that I know is on many of our minds at the moment, um, and it's that of quarantine and whether or not the 14-day uh, quarantine is going to be needed by the time students are coming over here for the September start. And I'm being asked, as you can see, Mr Chan from Hong Kong is just one of the parents asking us, are schools offering the quarantine facilities? Are guardians going to help and offer that? And what happens if I arrange um, a flight and book my quarantine arrangements and then I don't suddenly need it? So these are all the questions we're having. So I'm going to pose that question to, to Gareth initially. Thanks, Lana. Uh, delighted to be here. Thank you so much to, uh, for asking me to be on the panel and thank you to all my, my fellow panellists. Um, I'm just going to reach behind my computer and take my, my crystal ball out and, and put it in front of me. Um, <laughs> I think the, the question of whether quarantine will actually be necessary uh, come August or September, I think is one that we would be foolish to definitively uh, answer uh, today. Uh, however, I think the most important thing to, to remember here is, is that whether there is or there isn't quarantine, um, the best position that a family and a parent can be in, uh, in terms of placing their, their children into the United Kingdom, is to have a a very strong level of communication with the school that they're going to, uh, have a very solid understanding of their relationship with their guardian or the guardianship provider, and have a, a, a three-corner conversation about what to do in various different scenarios. Um, if quarantine is allowed in schools, then schools will be offering quarantine, I'm fairly certain. If quarantine is not allowed in schools, then I'm fairly certain guardians and guardianship agencies will step up and work together to assist families to do that. Um, we, we, we can't give certainties. Uh, it's a dynamic situation and things are changing all of the time. Uh, a couple of months ago there was no call for quarantine, there's no question of it, and maybe in a couple of months time then, then quarantine again may or, or may not be important. We can see in the news all of the time the, re the reduction on the restrictions for quarantine uh, and that's likely to change again come August and certainly September. But the, mo the, the best piece of advice is to have a solid uh, communication between school, uh, parent, student and guardianship organisation uh, and there is a great willingness within the sector to enable this to uh, to work and to enable children to come back safely into the United Kingdom. I'm going to make two small points if I can here. The first is uh, to back up Alex at the very beginning. You have to remember that British boarding schools and independent education has been around since the sixth century. Uh, we've gone through world wars, we've gone through previous pandemics, uh, we've gone through uh, revolution, you know, we've, got, we've gone through all sorts of different traumas and we're still here and still providing a, a fantastic uh, level of education. And my second point uh, and uh, before Lana cuts me me off and shuts me up uh, is that um I wouldn't dream of it. <laughs> is that everybody in education comes into education not to make a profit, uh, not to turn a quick buck but to look after healthily and, and safely the education of young people uh, and there is no safer and better place than for your child to be come September uh, or for the next academic year than in a British boarding school where you will have everybody turning their attention not only to uh, their, their education which is their prime, uh, their prime directive but also to delivering that in a healthy and safe manner. I'm going to pass the buck to Charlotte now, uh, who can give you some, some more detail on, uh, on uh, what guardianship agencies might be doing in, in quarantine. But please uh, be reassured, we're all working together to make sure your children will be safe when they're with us. Thank, Thank you, Karen. Um, yeah, so just talking about quarantine, obviously, as guardians, we've been having lots of conversations with schools over the last few, few months and even before then. And the good news is that most schools are able to offer quarantine. Um, but if they can't, uh, perhaps they aren't set up to do so. Uh, Bright World and other Aegis accredited guardians that we've spoken to can offer quarantine. So that is the good news. As Gareth has said, we are quite sure um, that things will change as they have been over the the next few months and next few weeks even. Um, but if quarantine is still required, then as guardians and as schools, we are working together to make sure that your child is safe. Um, in terms of booking flights, I know that this is a question on lots of parents' minds is when to book flights. And we are recommending that flexible flights are booked where possible. 
um, but most schools are going to accept students even if quarantine isn't required um, at that early point in August. If however they aren't, then as guardians we are set up to assist um, and we will be placing them within a host family or within our quarantine and settling in programme at Cambridge Malkia College. Okay, that's lovely. So it, it seems that as Gareth and, and Charlotte have both alluded to, it's we're all pretty unsure as to what's going to be required, but whatever is going to be required as guardians and schools we, we've got that covered together. So keep talking to us and keep talking to your schools. Um, Corrie, if I could now hand over to you, we had a specific question from Uliana, um, who's one of our Bright World parents from Russia. And um, welcome, Uliana, if, if you are here and, and listening in. Um, basically, Uliana's worrying about um, what happens if she wants to come or a parent wants to come to the UK with their child and, and accompany them if there's quarantine, if there's not quarantine, um, are there any special rules or guidance to give and also if non-essential travel is still um, imposed by the foreign office in will it be possible to travel at all? So this was Uliana's question. Thank you, Lana, and thank you to the parent for submitting that question. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I think, firstly, all parents need to understand that uh, when they arrive in Britain and when the students arrive in Britain, it, they, they are not subjected to police controls any more than usual at the airport. Um, and there is no house-to-house -house follow up on quarantine uh, at the moment. So the um, nature of the British society continues to be um, one of uh, sensible self-control and, and uh, a degree of trust. So uh, students should feel confident of coming without the need for a special permission to uh, the UK, where they can then proceed to quarantine if necessary, either with a school or with the guardianship. Uh, we actually think that quarantine may well be lifted uh, by August and actually that that probably won't be necessary anyway. But if it is still in place, uh, your question is whether parents can come as well. Uh, and so the answer is there is nothing to stop parents coming to Britain with their child. Um, but you must liaise with the school because, for example, at Box Hill School, where we would be offering quarantine if it's still necessary, we would um, ask that parents do not stay with their children. So you may want to liaise with the school about their specific circumstances. If you choose to quarantine in Britain with your child, you would have to respect all the guidelines from the UK government about self-isolation, which you could theoretically do for two weeks and then be safe to register and go to the school after that time. Um, you asked about special permissions. I don't think that is necessary at all. Um, and also about, you know, whether you, it's advisable for a parent to travel with the, with the student. My recommendation would be that the, pa that the children will be looked after and in most cases picked up from the airport with special um, uh, routines for personal protection for example the taxi drivers are all um, uh, well equipped to um, socially distance and have um, masks and things like that or the school might provide a minibus service or other means of transportation as well as the guardians as well so it isn't something to get particularly worried about you can send your child safely to the school on their own you can accompany them to britain without concern and then you need to negotiate with the guardian or the school about whether to drop off early or to self-isolate yourselves. Thank you very much Corey. Um, the next question we have um, is, is to Suzanne. Um, Suzanne as a, as a representative of, of schools and 
Um, what are the concerns that you've been getting? Because I know you speak to agents a lot um, and their, their customers and clients about returning to the UK in September. What, what are the main concerns? And is there anything else that we can do to reassure them? Thank you, Lana. Well, thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel. Um, as you said, I'm in regular contact with our agents and we've we conducted a survey in early May and shared the findings with our member schools. And some of those concerns continue to, to, to carry on. Um, we've covered some of the points, quarantining, of course, and lots of details around that, how schools will manage social distancing and organizing bubbles within, uh, within the classes and boarding. Can they wear masks? Health and safety with regards to hand washing, cleaning. What will happen if the child shows symptoms when they're in the school? What medical provision does the school have? Um, what happens if there is another outbreak and how will schools cope? What will schools do um, with a child if they were to show symptoms? Uh, what would happen if there are visa delays and they can't start the school on time as planned? Will there be flights available and will they be affordable? Um, there's also lots of negative media coverage in different countries, I think particularly in Asia. I know agents in Germany have said that the media has covered um, the, the handling of COVID in the UK negatively. So I think the agents are working hard to combat that. Um, so there are lots of things that families are concerned about around the world. As an organisation, I'm also very aware that agents are concerned about their businesses um, and their livelihoods. So um, I'm, I'm concerned about the impact of, on them. Some schools have not been able to run Income is lower for them um, for the summer term placements uh, because schools, um, understandably and rightly so, have not been charging full boarding fees for online learning. But this impacts the income for agents and their cash flow. And of course, some governments in other countries have not supported businesses as the way the UK has. So agents have had to cover staff fees without any income. Um, so that's, that's fairly challenging. So I'd actually like to take the opportunity to thank uh, educational consultants and agents on behalf of everything that they do for our sector and how hard they've been working for us in the coming months. They are vital to the, the whole sector. Um, working together and keeping communication going is critical. Um, and at BBSN, we feel that our role is, is very much to facilitate that. And we've been um, uh, run, we're running a webinar this Friday we're also doing a virtual networking event next week. So we're trying to enable schools and agents to keep in regular communication. Um, and I think that's vital. I think in terms to answer your question, what, what more can we do? I think that communication is vital. And, and agents have certainly said that schools have been very professional and very good at keeping them informed. So they in turn can keep their families um, informed. I think the Safe School Initiative and the BSA Charter uh, will reassure families and agents as to what the measures that the schools are putting into place. I think it reflects the, the values of care that British schools have. Um, and I think it illustrates how seriously the schools are taking that responsibility uh, for the children in their care. That's great. Yes, I, I second that. And I, I also um, applaud and thank all of the overseas agents and those who are with us joining us today for, for the hard work that they are doing. Um, I'm hoping that some of those questions that you, you raise, um, Suzanne, on behalf of agents are now going to be answered in some of the, the questions forthwith. Um, Eve, if I can turn to you now, um, what's, what are schools doing um, to make this? What are some of the things that schools are doing to make extra efforts to get um, students back um, for September and safely? Great. Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to briefly, if I may, Lana, add oh, my thoughts to this is really an unprecedented opportunity with which I think is a reflection of, of the ways in which everybody's trying to pull together at these extraordinary times. So it, the short answer to that very um, important question is probably a multitude of different things. Um, what you've probably heard from a variety of the speakers already is that conditions locally, um, different schools, different parts of the world, everybody's got their own particular set of circumstances around this. And I think what, we, what we're doing as schools is trying not to have a one size fits all approach. You know, this is the policy from the school and everybody's just got to somehow 
adjust to that. We recognize that this is such a difficult situation for everybody and that the, the way that the pandemic is working its way across the world isn't to a unified time frame. And there will be countries that are lagging and countries that are leading and various people's families and parents with work and traveling and working from home and all these things. It's just layers of complexity that have been added to the landscape really. And probably we are focused on September, but we, are, we must responsibly as schools be thinking about beyond September. Because if you, if you do send your, your child over to the UK for boarding, you want to be thoughtful about how you're going to get them back. <laughs> I'm sure you're not sending them away on a one-way one ticket. So we are in our schools, we, are, we always anyway do a lot of annual planning. So we're looking at the whole year, not just the September return or half terms or Christmases, but we're looking over that over the hill to January, to Easter holidays, to half terms and so on. And I think what we've all trying to do here is make sure that we do everything possible for the start of the year. But if possible, use that opportunity to get systems in place so that parents and guardians and agents don't have to somehow reinvent the conversation every time there's a holiday of some sort. Very you know, good point. Weeks, we have to start all of this again. So this will be the, this will be the most challenging one because it's new academic year, a lot of children starting new schools and obviously new uh, friendship groups and all that sort of thing. And that's always going to be a milestone anyway. So specifically to answer your question with the background there, that first of all, everybody's doing, I think everybody is thinking very imaginatively. We are thinking in a collaborative way to identify what, is, what are shared problems across schools and shared challenges across the sector, rather than everyone working individually by themselves. And we really welcome that. I think a couple of speakers have mentioned that already. This collaboration with more minds on the same problem, only good will come of that in the long term as well. So here at Cheltenham Ladies College, just as an idea of context, we have 840 pupils of whom 685 are boarders, of whom 200 live overseas and need to fly in, so spread, am spread amongst 47 countries. So the, the complexity that I mentioned, you can imagine what that is looking like in terms of the different conversations that we're having. And I think what we realized very early on was that we had to really shift our gear and say, we really need to be more proactive and more helpful to parents and guardians than we have ever been. Hopefully we've never been unhelpful as schools, but we need to do more. Um, and this also means, if necessary, consider what happens if the commercial airlines are grounded or they're just not flying or there is financial uncertainty around a commercial carrier Many of you will probably know about this much, you know, at more close range if you're abroad. So even if flights are published, how safe are those flights, et cetera? These will, I'm sure, be very natural questions that people have. And so we have been looking into, uh, uh, as part of a group of schools, actually exploring chartering of aircraft, because if you have enough to fill a plane, and companies do this all the time, corporates do this all the time, embassies relocate people, there's actually a very, very healthy industry of very safe, but not retail commercial aircraft, such as the famous brands everybody might recognize. But they are, those people are still flying, very much so. They have been the backbone, really, of the aviation traffic uh, it, on lots of common routes. And that's been really interesting for schools to explore, because there are definitely affordable and safe options there. So as it's turned out at the current time, we don't, we don't actually need to be chartering aircraft at the moment, but we've done the research, we've done the work, and we've now got a network of options there that might, might come in handy later on. Um, and so Lana, I, I hope that addresses the, the specific issue of, of the travel, but certainly picking people up at airports, offering airport transfers, 
um, as I say, and, and just trying to offer a flexibility of approach. We are not going to hold it against a child or a family if they are really, really impeded by visas or by flight availability or by quarantine arrangements back home or closing of the borders. We will be doing everything possible to maintain access to teaching and learning and also a sense of inclusion to our pastoral care structures really from the beginning of term, regardless of whether they're physically in the country or not. That's excellent. And the, the concept of chartering aircraft really does demonstrate those, that extra mile that schools are willing to go to and to look uh, innovatively at, at ways of, of helping overseas parents and students to, to come. So thank you very much for that. Um, if I can turn back to you now, Corey, um, and Charlotte, something that, that he aspired to there was that, that we are looking forward, you know, we're, we're looking to the, the time when students are, are back here, what happens next? And um, will, at least for the first term, will schools be remaining open for exeats and half term so that students don't have to go home or to a host family or, or what, what's the plan there Corey? Um, I think this could be quite a simple question to answer because for the most part schools will be making adjustments because of these times and uh, in all probability most schools will be remaining in some way open or providing alternatives for half term, uh, for extra study or tuition or activity, and for exeats. You do need to check with the school that is the one that you are signed up to, because there isn't a regulation from the government, so it is down to the school to decide. Uh, certainly at Box Hill School, we are remaining open, and I know from conversations with my other colleagues that many of them are. Obviously, guardians will also be available um, for the, the, those who cannot uh, or, or for other reasons can't provide. So that's the general answer to speak with the school and that probably many of them will say that they are making some provision. That's, that's yeah. great, yes. I think that's the impression we're getting. Sorry, Charlotte, over to you. Uh, no, I would just add to that as well as that most schools that we're speaking to are actually staying open for exeat weekends and half terms. Some, however, are still closing, perhaps for their half term. Um, some I've been speaking to actually are choosing to uh, stay open for exeat weekends, but perhaps close for a half term. Um, but as Corey said, on the whole, most schools are staying open uh, and if they aren't able to stay open, then as guardians, we're of course stepping in and doing what, what we know how to do best, which is to place our students with host families or within our residential programme in Cambridge. Um, and I know Adam would second that uh, lots of Aegis accredited guardians, we're already um, we, we've been through it with coronavirus and we've all really stepped up to the plate. Um, so we are here and ready to help schools in whatever way we can um, and be as flexible as possible. Thank you. Um, so now this came in from uh, one of our uh, parents and this was her actual email. She, she won't mind me ask, uh, transcribing this to you all. Her main concern for her daughter coming back was her daughter's safety. And um, this is what she asked. If her child gets coronavirus while she's at school, she's asking who would take care of her daughter. Would it be the school? Would it be the guardian? Who would send her child to hospital? And where would she be staying during her isolation period? If I could ask that question to you, Eve, um, please. Great. Uh, thank you, Lana. And um, as it seems as if it's a parent specific to, to my school, if I may, I will answer specifically to my school <laughs> because I can and I can give probably, I hope, real confidence and reassurance on that. I'm not sure how much of what I'm going to say would apply to every single school. So I just I would just put that caveat. Um, However, so the questions really are about whose responsibility. Um, we, we, are, we are very, very fortunate here in that we have a um, very strong medical team already uh, because we have so many borders, nearly 700 full borders, even in a normal year. 
We're very, very used to doing this. We've been doing it for decades and decades. Um, under the leadership of our head of medical health and welfare, our lead nurse, um, we have been able to to configure one of our boarding houses, which was actually empty and awaiting refurbishment into a fully operational isolation boarding house. And so to answer her question specifically, um, this, this house is gonna be used for testing, for suspected cases, and for looking after anybody who does actually have test positive with COVID we have the space we can keep people in full isolation and we are kitted out with a very large quantity by then it's we've ordered it and it's on its way a large quantity of ppe and adequate um kit so um in answer to her question we certainly would not be saying oh my goodness you're ill um you're not our problem anymore you know, as far as humanly possible, we would look after the girl. Um, if she became very ill, obviously we would certainly be talking to parents and guardians throughout. I think it's important to emphasize from the minute that the parent signs up with a guardian, actually it's a three-way partnership from that point onwards. So there should never be a time when one of those three people don't know what's going on. Ideally, all three of them are just being kept informed as a situation um, develops. But as, as we all know, the, um, the recovery rates and indeed the, the, the way in which this particular illness affects young people by and large is that they do not become seriously unwell. They have it, it passes, and they get on and they're clear of it. So we are, we are you know, 90 plus percent sure that actually that would simply mean rather like having a having the flu having a different kind of illness but in the meantime because of the infection risk we will be able to completely isolate the child and take care of her that's lovely thank you and gareth you have you do you have anything to add there yes thanks Donna. i, I just want to, to congratulate eve on on that um that, that thorough answer and, and Cheltenham ladies college's response to to what happens when somebody possibly does catch COVID-19. I just want to, to reiterate and echo her last point in that uh, young people, uh, as everybody will, will be aware, uh, are, would seem to be in one of the lowest risk categories uh, for catching COVID-19 uh, of any type of person. And in fact, when they do, if they do catch COVID-19, then the symptoms are perhaps not as severe as they are uh, for somebody with a, a different age profile uh, or somebody who's, who's less vulnerable. And therefore you're already in the lowest risk category. Um, one of the things that I, I think that, uh, that again, many schools are doing is looking at having separate health centers so that you have a, a set of uh, staff who are able to deal with those people who have COVID-19 uh, if it's to, to come into the community and uh, a separate set of staff looking at those that do not. So the, the health care of the, the, uh, the majority of students can still be dealt with effectively uh, whilst giving uh, special care and attention to those that, that do have that. Um, all schools are required to publish risk assessments uh, and as part of the risk assessment, uh, this question will be answered fully by each and every school. Uh, and again, I reiterate looking after young people health and safety as long as cyber education is a, a core part of what we do uh, and I'm pretty certain you can interrogate every school's risk assessment very closely and find a, a fantastic answer to uh, what will happen if my child gets ill and to go back to, to Eve's first point uh, children get ill they get ill every year uh, and having a virus in the United Kingdom is actually not a very big deal in the, in the first term uh, when we all come over to different weather conditions and the health centres and the health staff work magnificently in British boarding schools to be able to, to make sure that young people are healthy and well uh, and they can get on with it with the core part of the business which is which is education so uh, I would put people's minds at rest here the, the schools are perfectly well kitted out as their own little communities to be able to to help to isolate to, to, to heal uh, and to get people happily back into the working environment. Thank you, Gareth. Um, yes, I don't know if anyone else has anything they, they'd like to add. Um, I certainly have got that impression from schools I've been speaking to that um, it, should a child fall ill whilst at school, then very, very much that schools echo um, what Gareth and, and Eve has said, um, that they will take care of them within school. But Charlotte, I'm going to ask you now what happens um, if a child has left school because it's half term 
and is in a host family during the holiday times and falls ill? And that was the second half of the question, really, um, because that is is responsible. Yes, and I do think this is obviously a big worry for parents, um, but we just wanted to re reassure everyone that we are following the, the Public Health England advice, um, which says that you should isolate where you are if you do uh, get the symptoms of coronavirus. And that would also apply to children that are staying within a Bright World host family or within their other Aegis accredited guardians host family. Um, at Bright World, we have our uh, host family COVID-19 safe plan. Uh, we ask all host families to sign up to that even before they begin taking care of a student. Um, and just to tell you what that means, the host family is actually therefore agreeing to continue care taking care of the child if they become at all symptomatic whilst within the household. Um, so this has actually, you know, I think that's a really important thing for parents to know um, that whether they are going to be at school or within a host family and they did develop symptoms of coronavirus, um, they would be taken care of and their care would be of excellent care as well. Um, so if the situation was to become um, more serious, um, our host families would also uh, take the necessary steps to um, take the child to hospital or to provide them with the necessary medical care. So I hope that that helps to answer that question. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, Gareth, did you have something to add there? Sorry, Lara, I'm being greedy and, uh, and sticking my hand in the air a lot and adding, yes. Uh, just just, a, just a, a quick plug here, uh, and that is uh, with an anecdote, anecdote if, I, if I may. I think that this is a, a, a really good and opportune moment to remind parents that actually uh, guardianship uh, uh, agencies and having a guardian for your, for your child when they come to the United, United Kingdom is not an unnecessary burden. It's actually quite, a, it's a vital part of providing a, a triangle of care for, for the child when they're, when they're home away from home. Having somebody to support the student uh, outside of the, the school, which does a fantastic job anyway, but having somebody else to support and act on your behalf is vital and crucial. We had um, some students this year when, when uh, COVID-19 struck and the schools were closed who had guardians who were um, perhaps elderly uh, family members uh, who uh, were vulnerable uh, themselves and not able to, to protect and look after young people. And when the families wanted them to go and stay with them, well, they, they simply couldn't. And they were left in, in, a, in a bad place in terms of their guardianship. So when, 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 um, when families are, are, are looking to, to appoint a guardian, do ask, do ask and interrogate the guardians and the guardianship agency uh, to find out exactly what it is that you're going to get as part of the service. And as Charlotte's very, very carefully said there, uh, the charter that the Bright will provide uh, ahead of uh, students signing up with them it is a, a fantastic example of going the extra mile uh, for making sure that guardianship agency delivers what you want as parents but please don't see guardianship as a uh, an unnecessary evil it's absolutely vital and crucial to have the right service in at the right time and you never know what the right service is until a crisis hits uh, and important to make sure that you do uh, pick the right guardian for you for your son or daughter Thank you, Gareth. That wasn't greedy at all. Thank you. Um, and Alex, you, you, you've raised your hand. You, can, you've got something to add there. Yes, I, I think a lot of this is about reassurance and the schools have hopefully reassured people about their response. And I think what Gareth said about guardianship is incredibly crucial. But one of the questions we um, had on the chat from uh, uh, Letitia has been, she's worried what happens uh, if people go into hospital. And I think it's really important, actually. Uh, I've been uh, overseas myself. I've been living overseas. I'm a parent of two UK boarders in, uh, in a UK school. And um, I've seen some of the reports that have been coming out in other countries about um, the NHS, its capacity to actually be able to uh, cope. And what I would like to... to really reassure people is that I think a lot of these news reports have been sensationalizing. Um, the UK government was very clear that its first priority was to ensure that the National Health Service was not overwhelmed. We built uh, hospitals, 
we um, extra hospitals, we brought back um, retired uh, medical practitioners and so on. In those hospitals were not required. And the first test for the UK government to bring us out of lockdown was that the NHS was not overwhelmed. So I think in many ways, it's one of the most um, important um, uh, uh, things which have been um, a real success in the UK is that our health service has coped. Um, our, our response has been coordinated and, um, and that's something to be celebrated and hopefully will reassure parents who are worried no matter how well the school um, does things no matter how you're breaking up there a bit um, I'd like to, while Alex is breaking up I'd just like to address Hayley when Young's they get to hospital I think I'm good on um, I'd just like to address Hayley's question and I just wanted to clarify um, so her question was about um, whether guardians are committing to take care of children who do have coronavirus, whether they're in school or, or with their host family. Now, this is a really important question, um, and, and I do think it, it needs clearing up. So the, the rules in the UK are that if a child does develop symptoms of coronavirus, they should isolate where they are. Um, and so this is something that that schools here and all of the schools in the UK have committed to. So if your child becomes unwell at school, then they will be isolated and they will be taken care of by the medical staff within the school. Um, if they are with their guardian and if they're with a Brightwell host family or an Aegis accredited guardian, then they will be taken care of throughout the whole of their illness. And um, so I just wanted to clarify that. that that clears that one up. Sorry, and, Alex. And Jeremy, did you have something to add there as well? You need to unmute. Yeah, no, I mean, just really to back up what Alex was saying in, ter in terms of the National Health Service. I mean, the, the, you know, there's a reason why we have one of the highest life expectancies in the world, equal to almost identical, I, I believe, to Germany. And the reason for that, um, as we all know, it is because of National Health Service. And I think we'd all, we'd all recognise uh, that in the early stages of the pandemic, that the UK government, in terms of some of the provision of PPE and so forth, that, that, that they weren't as quick out of the blocks as, as they should have been. I think it's also worth remembering that there had been no pandemic or, or of its nature in the UK since 1918. Um, but I, I think just to really echo what, what Alex said, that um, the, the, this the sensationalisation of, of the uh, NHS's uh, response or ability to, to respond, of course, painted a picture. Certainly, uh, certainly in the Asian media, I'm, I'm very aware of. So, so for example, um, the South China Post, um, that you know that the, 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 the NHS was almost buckling under pressure. And of course, we know that actually, in, in all the vital aspects, there was the, the, the NHS, even at the height of the pandemic, was never close um, to, to, to being. Um, overpressurised, and indeed, those thousands and thousands of places created in new hospitals were, of course, never never used. So, I think that um, to just conclude that that of course, moving forward now, we have an NHS which has stockpiled over two billion uh, pieces of PPE. We have the exper the, the experience of, of obviously of the last uh, few months, um, and uh, you know, I think we're, we're in a very good position moving forward now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeremy, for that. Um, this um, is just leading on then, Jeremy. Um, with that in mind, one of our parents, uh, Miranda, and uh, hello, Miranda, if you're, you're listening in today, I think you are. Um, Miranda wrote in and asked if it's necessary to buy medical insurance um, in view of this epidemic, um, and that would they be treated in, a, in an NHS um, or, or a private hospital? I think a lot of parents don't really understand how the process works of private and, and NHS care here. I mean, I, I, <clears throat> I think the thing, the thing to emphasise, of course, is, uh, as um, I think Gareth was saying, you know, that the, 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 the children typically obviously only have the very mildest of, of symptoms. So it, the, 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 the likelihood of them requiring hospital care it, it, you know, it's extremely unlikely and actually I think as Gareth was also saying that we are used to and have been for, for, for decades 
or if, if not centuries, to looking after children. So we have medical centres. Almost every school will, will have their own doctor. They will, they will have a team of nurses. Um, so we are very, very well set up in that sense, regardless of, of, of whether a child comes, becomes ill with any sort of illness. I mean, we're focusing on COVID-19, but um, you know, children do, do become ill at any time, um, uh, unfortunately. So I, I think that the key thing to say there is that in the very extreme unlikelihood that a child was to, to become seriously ill with COVID-19, um, that the, 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 they would be treated obviously in the NHS, which would provide the very, very highest quality of care. Medical insurance, um, there would be no discernible advantage to that, given that uh, you know, it's generally recognised that our children's hospitals in particular, some of the like Great Ormond Street or the Order if you're in the north of England, they're some of the very best hospitals in the world. Um, and the, the, you know, they're free to the at the point of access. Um, so yes, one could have additional private medical health care, but that would be more likely to receive maybe slightly quicker treatment in a non-essential emergency, such as a, a broken bone or, so, or something of, of that nature, or a medical procedure that was non-essential. If anybody needed essential medical care in, in terms of it being COVID-related, then they would, they would obviously receive outstanding care within an HS hospital, and at that point, private medical health care really, whether or not one had it or not, wouldn't really determine or alter the, you know, the, the fact you'd be able to access the very highest quality of care. Thank you. Naomi, did you have something to add? You raised your hand. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add in really that um, all international students that are coming in on tier four will have to pay um, the immigration health surcharge as well. And as Jeremy rightly said, it's you know, it is to cover you for those emergency situations and um, you know, it will cover you for our NHS services. So um, you know, many, many families will know that they have to uh, lay out this additional cost in addition to visa fees as well. Thank you. And Adam, if you unmute, did you have... Um... Yes, thank you. It's pretty much been mentioned really by Jeremy and Naomi, but in, in effect um, with that question, there's no change really from how it's always been. Um, so it's always been the case that we have the NHS, which is very strong and robust, and it is, that is the case um, with it now. Um, it's proven that over recent months. Um, but again, as Naomi said, look, if there's a um, specific operation that's needed, maybe a sports injury and a ligament has got to be repaired, you can do that on the NHS, or get it done a little bit quicker by having private. So that's it's the same as it ever has been. So there's no, no change um, in that side. Yes, and I think a lot of parents do buy medical insurance, private medical insurance, just to cover all of those eventualities. And we use um, an organisation called CareMed, who has a specific uh, policy for students. Corey, if you, do you want to add something? Yeah, I simply think it might be helpful to provide a personal anecdote at this time. I, I'm fortunate enough to have private medical insurance. But personally, if I caught COVID-19, which I hope I don't, but if I did catch it, I'm pretty sure that I would be um, taken to hospital if that was necessary, uh, treated by the NHS because it would be an emergency situation at that time. And I have every confidence that they would give me the best uh, and world-class care and that there wouldn't be a waiting list or a problem. So that's a personal uh, sort of anecdote from a UK citizen, uh, which should, I think, reassure most people. Thank you very much. Um, Jerry, the, the subject of testing, we get asked about that quite a lot. Um, will schools be doing, taking out and conducting their own testing? Um, and for these, this means when students aren't symptomatic um, and it's just to show that if, if they have COVID-19 or not. Yeah, I, I think um, schools, certainly the, the schools I've been talking to, uh, and I'm, I, I'm sure it's the same for all of us, are, are, are taking slightly different approaches to this and, and to, the, to, to the whole issue of testing. I mean, obviously on one level, a, you know, a test just to check your whole sort of pupil population quickly becomes out of date. Um, so that there's sort of question marks over the, the frequency of testing. I think some schools, we're, we're amongst them, are going to um, have tests initially when people arrive. Um, so whether or not that's quarantine still in place or not, that, that's what we in, intend to do. So, so we know that starting off perhaps on day 
one and then perhaps on day 14 that, 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 every, that everything's in everybody's in good health worth as well saying that if anybody was symptomatic within a school setting then it, it's an almost certainty that of course on the nhs that they would then be access to testing not only of them um, but, but anybody they've been in contact with i think that what a, a lot of schools are now doing though is developing essentially their own sort of um sort of trace and tracking in, in, in terms of and, and i know that there's there's talk at the moment uh, possibly of, of children wearing fitbits for example the, the technology is very straightforward um, and we've been asked to trial that as a school where everybody wears a fitbit and were somebody to test positive um, upon presentation of symptoms then it's actually very easy to download who has been in significant proximity with that student very, very quickly, and those are the people that you'd isolate. So it might be somebody who's been in contact with them for one point within a, you know, two meters or whatever, or one meter for more than just a minute. So I think that what, what we'll see is we, we have gone, a, a, we've traveled a huge distance since we all first heard of COVID-19, uh, I think at the end of January. Um, and, and I think that what you will see is, is that both as a sector, but also schools individually um, taking innovative, um, methods harnessing uh, the potential of technology as well um, to, to make sure that we've got the checks and balances in place to not only keep our minimize risk and to keep um, our communities safe but also to make sure that uh, you know if somebody does present with COVID-19 you know which, which, which they could um, that we're then able to respond effectively um, and, and in a way which uh, means that we, we contain that very very successfully. Thank you very much. Um, Gareth, um, just briefly, if you could just run us through some of the extra measures that schools are putting in place to reduce the risk of infection, um, extra things um, that, that, that schools are doing. Absolutely, yeah, no trouble at all. I think we've heard of many of them already whilst we've uh, we've been going through the um, uh, the discussions today from various different panel members. Uh, but the, the the basic information that's being uh, given out by Public Health England, Public Health Wales, and and, and Scotland, etc., uh, it still stands. The, the washing of hands regularly, the, the making sure that we are um, using the the correct cleaning measures to ensure that we are personally clean uh, is down to our own individual responsibility and encouraging students and staff and members of our community to accept that responsibility I think is crucial and key to ensuring that, that we all stay as safe as possible. Um, and I, I, that is a point I, I want to reiterate whilst I, I will mention in a moment a whole series of, uh, of things that, that schools are doing uh, we must also remember that, that ultimately um, we are all responsible for our own health. Uh, students, uh, staff uh, and other community members as well uh, and educating young people to understand that um, taking care of themselves, their own, their own cleanliness, their own health and safety, their own hand washing, uh, their own social distancing uh, amongst their own group of friends it is as crucial and as vital uh, as the, the imposed regime that comes in from, from the school themselves. So corporate responsibility, individual responsibility, they're, they're indistinguishable. Uh, you've heard already to schools talking about uh, using thermal scanners uh, for students coming into school to check temperatures, uh, talking about uh, thermometers and temperature checking. Uh, we've heard talk here about social distancing, uh, about reducing numbers in classes, uh, about having perspex shields between the, the staff and the students. Uh, and again, one of the most vulnerable points within our schools are actually our staff. Uh, they are much older than our students, one would hope, uh, and, and therefore more vulnerable than the young people themselves. So we have a, a duty of care to everybody in our community, uh, staff and, and students alike, to ensure that they are safe uh, and they are protected uh, in this time uh, is important. Uh, masks are becoming de rigueur, as Jeremy said, they're a fashion item nowadays. Um, I, I, think, um, I think we've even got branded ones for Cardiff Sixth on College, you know, woe be tied us walking around with a brand on, on the middle of our face, but I, I'm sure that that's, uh, that's going to look fine. Um, and, and young people will come with, with their own ideas as, as to how they can, they can augment that and add to that uh, in terms of personal safety. So there are many, many things that, that, that schools are doing uh, to enable uh, the, the community to remain safe. Uh, our staff, for example, have all, uh, are all undergoing um, thorough training on how to uh, clean their classroom. Uh, as, many, as, as much as uh, we can, our staff are staying in the same place, but if they have to change, then they are actually cleaning their classrooms. They have um, deep cleaning training with full PPE to ensure that uh, if any, whoever comes in behind them and, and uses that room will, will be 
be safe with you as a member of staff uh, and students likewise. So there are, there are a whole raft of measures uh, and I think that these will, these will increase rather than decrease uh, as we become educated and learn more about uh, how to keep our, our young people safe uh, <coughs> as this situation continues. I think one of the ones that, um, that was just uh, talked about here in terms of testing, a whole variety of different test measures uh, coming out that we've heard about schools that will be uh, will be testing on arrival and we're one of those and testing again at 14 day intervals to make sure students are still fit and healthy in the community uh, but also uh, testing before students have to leave uh, you know having the reassurance that when they fly home they fly home with a with a safe bill of health from their school I think is a is something which is very positive for, for parents to understand that we're we're dispatching them back if and when they do go back uh, in a, a manner that they are safe and healthy to, to travel and do so. Um, so there are a whole raft of things that will come out of this, Lana, uh, and uh, again, I go back, I sound like a, a stuck record here, but I, but I, would, uh, I would recommend again that, that parents stay in constant communication with, with their school. This is a dynamic situation and things will change over time. So I encourage them to keep that conversation going uh, and understand that, uh, that the schools will do as much as they possibly can uh, to keep uh, students healthy and safe. Thank you, Gareth. Um, Corey. A big question here for you. Um, what if schools suddenly have to close again? Yeah, and sure. Thank you very much, Lana. And I'm very conscious of time as well, so I'll try and keep my answer short. But having said that, the first thing is we think it's very unlikely. So back in March, things were very, very different, and uh, the government did uh, ask schools to close, and we all transitioned to virtual learning. We think that that is very unlikely. The UK now has an advanced test, track and trace system. Uh, we also have uh, an, uh, a policy around isolation. And it is much more likely that if, uh, even if uh, a student developed the virus, um, then they would be cared for in isolation or moved to hospital and medical care, but the school would remain open probably. And so I think that it is unlikely and that parents should not worry too much about that. However, it is possible and if a school was required to close, firstly it would probably not be for a long time. So I do think that the best thing would be to rely on guardians rather than to fly home or make provision for flying home. And that's where a company like Bright World can be very, very helpful uh, uh, for you. But also it is the school's duty of care that we've already talked about and also our moral responsibility to make sure the children are safe at all times. So you can have total confidence that your child will not be simply pushed out of the door, but will be looked after. Um, at my school back in March, um, we kept students on for at least 10 days whilst we made sure that adequate provision, sensible flights uh, were provided and that the children were happy and that their mental health was protected and they didn't feel rushed or panicked. So that's a very important point as well. Uh, another example is that we did have a student at our school who um, unfortunately was not able to return with her mother to uh, the country of origin after borders closed and was not able to stay with her mother either. We actually took that student back and she stayed with us for uh, a, a considerable period of time, many, many days, um, and uh, she was sort of assimilated within the concept of her household. And I think she had a really good time. Uh, the school was a very different experience for her and she was still doing virtual learning uh, and sort of welcomed within the family. So your child would be looked after in that context. Um, and I hope that gives some reassurance um, that uh, it is unlikely schools will close. And even if a school had to close, your child would be looked after and guardians would be a very sensible thing to do. Thank yeah. you. And, uh, and just to add to that, really, um, that we have all been through the closure of schools um, back in March. Um, and we ha had to be extremely flexible um, in that some parents were booking flights. They were desperate to, to book flights and sometimes flights were cancelled or rearranged. But as guardians, we work together with schools um, to place students with host families until they could catch their flight. Even if they couldn't catch their flight, they returned back to their host family. Um, and we do actually still have a number of children 
who are living safely within host families, even now as we speak, um, who sadly weren't able to make it back to their home country due to travel restrictions. Um, but as Corey has said, um, if uh, schools were to close um, and boarding houses were to have to close, which is very unlikely, um, then we would work together as guardians and schools uh, to make sure that your child was safe until they could return home or back to school. And may I add to that, in fact, just one more point, which is um, I'm not sure how aware people are in other countries, but the government of England um, has been very, very clear in its stated aim to make sure that all children return to all schools in September. And they've made that a very public aim, which makes us think that the last thing that the government wants to do is to um, close schools again. And um, that's another reason why we have confidence that schools will almost certainly not be forced to close like they were in March. Thank you, Corey. Um, Naomi, um, Yelena from Montenegro um, asked um, about visa offices because they're, they were all closed and um, she's wondering when they're going to open. Can you help us with that? <laughs> so pretty similar to how Eve described it earlier is that the UK, each country is moving at its own pace. And this is reflected in the opening of visa centres. So um, unfortunately, at the moment, um, the v that specific visa centre um, is listed as remaining closed until further notice. Uh, but we know um, three weeks ago, uh, the centres in Hong Kong and, and China um, have opened, the same in Australia. Um, unfortunately, the US, um, there's still a large question mark over the US and the same with uh, South America. Mexico, for example, uh, that's still unknown. Um, and I know there's a lot of nervousness around this uncertainty for those centres that still remain closed as well. Um, what I would certainly recommend with families is that if they are having visa assistance to talk through alternative options that may allow the students still to travel um, and be here for September if, if centres remain closed. But um, if not, then to certainly discuss alternative teaching methods um, if they're expecting them to be a delay um, in entering the UK as well. Many of our clients, uh, such as the schools, are um, you know, putting provisions in place or continuing as they're doing now in such an amazing way as uh, having those distance learning measures um, should they need to start that off first and then enter the UK later on once the centre is open. Thank you very much. Um, um, Moving on now to a question for Adam um, regarding safeguarding. Um, what should schools and guardians be doing to ensure that overseas students are properly cared for at schools when they return in September? And how important is it that schools and guardians work together? Uh, unmute yourself. Um, I think I'll keep this one quite, quite brief because we've actually covered probably most of those main essence without within um, all that we've talked about um, today throughout the other questions. But something that, um, that I certainly subscribe to with, um, with regards to my work within my company, but also through Aegis, is that your safeguarding culture is only as strong as your weakest link. And that is something that with we look at uh, schools, we look at guardianships, they are working together. They're working together to make sure there is no weak link. And that's why it's important to have a, an accredited guardian who, who does all the right things to work well with the school. So with safeguarding, it will come down to the communication, really. Uh, the communication, listening to the child, um, understanding what the child's voice is like, understanding also from the parents if there's any concerns from the child as well. There's a lot more of that communication which we have seen happening in abundance over recent months. Um, and I think we'll see that as a, as a positive going forward. There'll be more communication between guardians and also with, with schools. But I, I mean, I've seen, um, I've had various calls with, well, with Eve as well um, over uh, the most recent months, you know, and other schools with regards to the whole area where, where safeguarding meets health and safety and where, where that links together, um, that schools have done so much planning that it really is, everything has been thought about. And if there is a scenario that does happen, there is someone who's going to be there to help and sort it out. And we are working together. So if there is a small guardianship organisation, they, they will also be able to draw upon support from, from others because we want to make this work. 
and everyone is committed through that. And I think that's where Safe Schools really supports um, going through that as well. So we have various bits of guidance that we work to. One's called Keeping Children Safe in Education. It talks a lot about mental health as well. So schools will be looking a lot into this area and supporting international students coming back, understanding about culture shock as well, which is a huge area. So I think with guardians and schools working together, we, you know, we are in quite a robust um, position at the moment. And that's, that's important um, with safeguarding. So that communication, I think, is, is the, the key crux of things. Thank you, Adam. Um, and just finally, um, before we go to Q&A, um, message from us, for us um, and from us on behalf of schools and guardians via the British Council to give parents reassurance um, to come back in September. Was it out to us, was it all? We seem to have, um, we seem to have lost uh, Alex, um, he's, he's overseas. Um, Corey, could I ask you to step in? Yeah, certainly, no problem. I, I think what we have tried to convey as a panel is the perspective of uh, safety, the fact that children can return to the UK uh, for schooling in September, that they will be well cared for, uh, that we have uh, an obligation and a duty to look after children and in fact that the situation in the UK whilst we're very conscious of the fact that there is a pandemic is not uh, a crisis situation and it's not a situation that parents should be overly alarmed about. I hope that you can see that schools, guardians and other organisations are working closely together and for us it is very much business as usual and we wanted to convey that and each school can uh, answer any specific question that you have about your family circumstances or about your children and I would very much encourage you to take that up with further questioning uh, after this webinar. Thank you. Eve was there something you wanted to say um, now? Hi, hi Lana, thank you. Just a couple of um, reflections if I may. A um, couple of questions really for any parents who are on the call or perhaps any agents who speak to parents a lot as well as focusing on what measures lie ahead of us or with this whole set of questions ask yourself one other what is the alternative of staying at home because actually being a day pupil back home requires many 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 journeys to and from school to and from school to and from school to and from school <laughs> on a daily basis that are going to probably involve you as parents as you try and return to your work, normal ways of working or use of public transport or use of other methods, all of which will also have their inherent risks. So when, if and when a child is admitted into a boarding environment, all of that simplifies massively. There is this big bit about getting here. But after that, you're talking about a four minute, well, my closest boarding house is a minute and a half to the classroom as girls who are very naughty and sleep in late in the mornings often tell me they can do it in a minute and a half. I go like, five minutes, <laughs> five, 10 minutes. It, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a different ball game. And every single thing, in some cases of our schools are here for over a hundred years have been looking after boarders who we know are away from you and we know um, you know homesickness and things like that but there will be a reason that you decided to send them over here in the first place and maybe just dusting the cobwebs off that reason asking yourself that reason again there is a reason that with very good schools in the countries that you are in at the moment you made the decision to have a look at a British school the curriculum the opportunities, the leadership training, and the, 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 it's the outcomes that come out of our schools that make us world leading as a sector. We don't have the monopoly on excellent schools. I am not so arrogant as to suggest that for one minute, but there is a reason that so many families consider us. 
And another huge benefit is that you is that because many families from different countries choose our schools, your daughter or son is going to grow up in their formative years exposed to a diverse set of perspectives. Let's put aside culture and ethnicity and faith, all of which play their part, but diversity of perspective. And when we look in industry and we look at employers and we fast forward to 2030, to 2040, that's actually when your sons and daughters are going to be hitting the workforce, getting into their stride in business, in industry, in the professions, in academia, and you, by the fact you're even on this call, means you have a passionate belief in the importance of education for the lifetime future of your, what is now your child. But actually, within a few years, it will be an adult. And for decades and decades, will be an adult. And the liftoff that comes from, yeah, we're in a pandemic, we're all in the grip of this. We've had volcanic eruptions of ash in Iceland a number of years ago that grounded the airlines, if you remember, and lots of my boarding colleagues here would remember very well. I was a housemistress at the time, girls at the airports, guardians, you know. I mean, be, we, before the internet almost. I mean, extraordinary. So we, I don't think we have ever had better tools. We have never had better mitigation of ways to cope with, deal with, adapt to this. And maybe the most powerful education of all is to model a positive, hopeful and collaborative response with courage and confidence to the challenges that face us in an interdependent world. Because once we get over this pandemic, there may be another one in 10 years time, 15 years time, when your children are the grown-ups, maybe with children of their own. And also, they will be dealing with a world affected by climate change. And if you look at some of the curves, we've all got used to flattening the curve diagrams of our health services. What about the climate curves on the global temperature and the capacity of our biosystems to cope? So educationally modeling how you solve problems from first principles, how you come together to face something that has never been faced before, and you do it with an international participation because we're an international country that welcomes our borders and has done for decades, Brexit or no Brexit, the people in this sector believe in a shared global future with all of our hearts. And that's why this matters so much. Well, thank you very much, E, for that. That's um, extremely reassuring. Adam? If I just um, add one thing in there, and I think it links to what Corey said, but just to emphasise that, in, in essence, schools haven't actually closed. I know borders had to leave. Um, schools did stay open for a lot of key workers, um, for children um, and, and people who were going to the NHS and, and that sort of side. Um, but, you know, schools have opened now. Um, there are certain year groups that are going back and they're, they're, they're working hard. Both of my two children, I've got one in year six, one in year 10. They're both at school. Um, they're back in school, in their bubbles, they're working things out. And schools, schools are already leading the way with, with how things are going to be for September. And things should hopefully be easier in September. But already they're functioning and they're doing very, very well. So we, we are confident. We are confident looking forward um, to how things will be in September. Well, thank you very much. We are um, being overwhelmed with, with questions coming in now. And I think that as time has moved on, um, a lot of those questions that have come in have already been answered. So I, I think we'll, we'll leave the Q&A um, to a written q and I, I endeavour to reply to all of the questions that have been written personally in, in the next few days. So anything I feel that wasn't answered, I, I will do that. You'll be pleased to know, Naomi, that Yelena has announced that the Montenegro visa office has in fact opened now. So she's delighted about that and is very grateful um, for, for your input today as well. Um, and we're getting a lot of, of great thanks from the participants, um, over 300 people listening today. So I would like to thank all of our panellists and everyone who's attended the webinar. And I hope you all found it useful and reassuring. Um, do feel free to email me 
um, if you have any questions, I can in turn pass them on to the panelists if I can't answer them myself. And um, a couple of you are asking if there is a link um, that's going to be available of a recording of the webinar and that's automatically recording to the cloud. So I'm going to be sending a link to all attendees um, and uh, anyone who, who would like one um, after this event. So you'll be able to, to watch and, and listen again. Um, and that just leaves me to, to thank everyone again. And here's to a safe September welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lana, very much. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Now. Bye.